Hello everyone, this is your College of Designs. We're going to tackle a different subject today. We're going to delve into physics and learn about electromagnetism and stellar evolution. We'll go over some terms and concepts and see how they apply to contemporary physics. The reason I'm putting this video together is because while all of this information is available out there, it is separated into many scholarly works. And there are no simple introductory guides into particle physics, especially ones that tie the subject with that of stellar evolution, uh, with which it's highly related. So I hope you'll find a grouping of this information helpful. Here we see some definitions. Uh, electromagnetism, electromagnetic spectrum, wavelength, frequency, quanta, and the speed of light. Uh, electromagnetism is basically um, your basic interaction of electric currents um, and magnetic fields. The electromagnetic spectrum is uh, the range of wavelengths and frequencies over which the electromagnetic uh, radiation extends. Uh, wavelength is the distance over which the wave's shape repeats. Um, so basically it's, it's the distance between the high point, uh, two high points of a wave um, or crests or two low points of a wave or two troughs. Uh, the frequency is the rate at which something occurs or is repeated over a particular um, period of time or in a given sample. Quanta, um, it's a discrete finite quantity uh, and in this case it relates to the uh, finite quantity of energy proportional in magnitude to the frequency of the radiation it represents. And we'll get to that, um, we'll see an equation that deals with this here in a minute. Uh, the speed of light, uh, as some of you probably already know, is um, 180,000 miles per second. It's a universal constant and it uh, places a limit on maximum achievable speed. Let's take a look at a diagram here of the electromagnetic spectrum. The very first um, striking concept that we're introduced to here is that everything um, that we may see as separate, uh, radio, television, uh, radar, ultraviolet rays from the suns, uh, microwave um, radiation from your basic microwave, uh, x-rays that you get at the doctor's office, uh, the, at first hand uh, or at first look they appear uh, separate. That however is not true. They're all part of the same spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, visible light is also included in this and it's actually a very small uh, section of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And here we see in nanometers the wavelength over which this occurs. And as we recall, wavelength is the distance between uh, two high points or two low points uh, over which the wave shape repeats. So the wave repeats uh, for, for real green light, the light at which our sun emits, um, around 550 nanometers. And what this means is that um, we, we see here FM, uh, frequency modulated, that radio does not receive sound, it receives light. And that is why a signal is capable to travel so, so fast, is because the relationship between wavelength and frequency uh, is fixed. When you multiply wavelength times frequency, you get the speed of light, no matter what, which uh, leads us to the conclusion that it's an inverse relationship. That is, if one rises, the other must fall for the relationship to continue to be true. And so here we see the equation. This is wavelength right here. Uh, times frequency equals the speed of light. Um, the equation towards the bottom uh, states energy is equal to HV, H being Planck's constant, uh, and V being uh, the frequency of an oscillator, or let's just call it frequency for, um, for ease. So the energy we see here is basically sliced up in HV sized quanta. Uh, if we go back, quanta being the discrete quantity of energy proportional to the frequency of the radiation it, repeat, uh, it represents. So what this equation says is that the energy of a particle of light, called a photon, is proportional to its frequency by a constant factor. Uh, it's a very, very small number, um, but Max Planck uh, in the early 20th century was able to calculate this, this value. And what he showed is that light is not continuous, it's not a stream, but more of a, a trickle, if you will, that it's emitted and absorbed between uh, different elements in packets or in, in certain levels, if you will. 
This means that photons with low frequencies, like radio waves, have lower energies than photons with high frequencies, like uh, X-rays, ultraviolet light, and gamma rays, which explains why, if we go back to this, this um, graphic here, that we see dangerous ionizing radiation and safe non-ionizing radiation. Even though both um, or all types of um, radiation travel at the speed of light, some are less energetic than others, and X-rays and ultraviolet rays are the ones that we most often hear about, uh, that we need to watch out for. Uh, ultraviolet rays being capable of causing burns and, and skin cancer, and X-rays um, also being able to cause some tissue damage if you're overexposed to them. Uh, whereas uh, radar and FM have sufficiently low energies that they pass through your body unnoticed without causing any harm. Um, here we see uh, the electron quantum numbers. Uh, so when we're talking about the speed of light and um, quantum particles, um, we necessarily talk about the electron. Uh, and we are all familiar with um, the atomic model. You basically have a nucleus of a proton and a neutron with an orbiting electron. Now, um, it's, a, it's a very simplistic representation and for the purposes of, our, um, of the uh, next discu discussions that will follow, let's expand on that concept a little bit. There are four different properties that an electron actually has when it orbits uh, that nucleus of an atom. The first is the orbit orientation. Um, Basically, does it does it orbit um, top to bottom, left to right, and so on? Um, and that's represented by the letter N. K represents the shape um, of or the elasticity, if you will, of, of an orbit. Is it um, perfectly circular or perfectly spherical? Um, is it a little bit of an ellip ellipsis? Um, it varies uh, from atom to atom. Uh, M uh, is the three-dimensional orientation in space. Um, Basically, if you will, um, imagine a, a, instead of a two-dimensional atomic model, imagine a three-dimensional atomic model where um, in a given layer uh, where the uh, atom belongs, uh, which they, actually that that is in the, the given layer or the given level um, in the atom the, that the electron belongs in. Uh, the 3D orientation is what part of that sphere are you going to find the electron in at any given point in time? And um, concept uh, a little more advanced than what we're going to cover here, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle states that uh, you can't find both the position uh, and the velocity or speed with the direction uh, of an electron or of a quantum particle. Uh, so if you know the its location in um, in, in the th three-dimensional sphere in which it's supposed to be located, then you can't know in which direction it's headed. And the last part is um, A over B or quantum spin given the values of um, negative and positive or plus or minus one half. And uh, that's, that's a little bit advanced that we'll probably cover uh, maybe in a different um, walkthrough. So uh, visible light basically is a form of electromagnetic radiation. Uh, it's visible to us because it's emitted at the right wavelength and frequency to be detected by our eyes. We, um, the sun emits at the yellow-green um, visible electromagnetic spectrum, and that is what our eyes and the eyes of a lot of um, um, members of the animal kingdom have evolved to see on, on our planet. Light, and in fact all types of radiation, uh, behaves like both, of a wa like both a wave and a particle. Um, it's not both at the same time, but rather exhibits properties of one or the other depending on the situation. Um, that is, uh, given the nature of the experiment performed. And what that means is that um, it's the experiment that determines what part, um, what property of light do we see at um, a, a single given time. So let's move on here. Here we see some more definitions. Um, and basically, there's a pattern to these definitions. They, they cascade on down um, that describe uh, more refined parts of the, of the first general definition. So an atom is made of an atomic nucleus. An atomic nucleus is made of a proton and a neutron, uh, which are both made of quarks, uh, as an electron, and, and so on and so on. Um, so an atom uh, is the basic unit of a chemical element. 
the atomic nucleus is the very dense region at the center of an atom. Uh, proton is a stable, positively charged subatomic particle occurring in, um, in all of the atomic nuclei. Neutron is a stable, neutral subatomic particle occurring in all atomic uh, nuclei. The electron, again, is a stable but negatively charged subatomic particle, uh, and it's found in an orbit around an atom. It's the primary ca carrier of electricity in solids. Uh, quark, um, it's any number of subatomic particles carrying a fractional charge, or a plus or minus one half. Uh, and it's postulated as, as comprising the building blocks of hadrons, neutrons, and protons. Hadrons, and that brings us to hadrons, is a subatomic particle of a type including the baryon and the mesons that can take part in the strong interaction, uh, or the strong force. And here we see why uh, the need for, for cascading definitions. Uh, hadron is defined basically by baryons and mesons. Uh, which brings us to their definitions. Uh, baryon is a subatomic particle, such as uh, a nucleon or a hyperon, uh, that has a mass equal to or greater than that of a proton. Uh, hadron is made up of three quarks, um, such as uh, a proton, a neutron, and, and so on. Uh, those are examples of baryons, uh, that, uh, the, because they're all made up of three quarks. A meson, uh, that's a subatomic particle that is intermediate in mass between an electron and a proton. A neutrino, and there's different types and uh, different flavors, if you will, of neutrinos, and we'll go over those um, here in a minute, uh, is a neutral subatomic particle with a mass close to zero and half integral spin, uh, rarely interacting with normal matter. Um, now, when we talk about spin, we're talking about uh, those four properties of an electron, uh, A over B. Uh, with spin taking the values of either plus or minus one half. Uh, a boson is a force carrier particle. Uh, sometimes you'll hear about the Higgs boson, and that's the theoretical particle that carries uh, force charges from from different uh, particles. Photons, uh, for example, light, gluons, and uh, W and Z particles are all bosons. Like I said, the Higgs boson is a proposed as a mechanism by which particles acquire mass. Uh, the lepton, uh, that's a matter particle. Uh, it's subatomic, uh, such as the electrons, the muons, uh, or neutrinos, uh, that don't take uh, any part in a strong interaction force. Um, that is the force that holds an atom together, and we'll, we'll go over that here in a second. Fermion is uh, any basic matter particles. Leptons, electron, and neutrino, and quarks are fermions. So the lepton that we saw here uh, is basically a fermion. The strong interaction force, um, or the sh strong interaction or strong force, is the interaction that binds a proton and a neutron together in a nucleus. Um, it's what holds the, the nucleus of an atom together and it's mediated by gluons. Just a few more definitions here. Um, we see radiation, radioactivity, nuclear decay, uh, alpha and beta decay, emission, and emission and absorption lines. Uh, radiation is the emission of energy as an elect electromagnetic wave or as a moving subatomic particles. Radioactivity is the spontaneous emission of a stream of particles or electromagnetic rays in the nuclear decay. Uh, which brings us to nuclear decay, which is the process by which an unstable atomic nucleus loses energy by emitting ionizing particles or radiation that is alpha or beta decay, uh, which again brings us to alpha and beta decay. And alpha decay is the radioactive decay of an atomic nucleus that is accompanied by the emission of a helium ion. And beta decay is the decay in which an electron is emitted. Uh, your basic Geiger counter uh, counts how many electrons strike its plate, um, and that's how you hear the tick. Emission uh, is the production uh, and discharge of something, especially gas or radiation. Um, and emission lines and absorption lines, or spectral lines if you will, um, is uh, spectral lines or are spectral lines um, that are dark um, when we talk about absorption lines or bright when we talk about emission lines in an otherwise uniform and continuous spectrum, that is the electromagnetic spectrum, resulting in an excess um, in, in, in the case of absorption or in a deficiency in the case of an emission line of photons in a narrow frequency range compared with uh, nearby frequencies. And what that means is uh, that we're, if you're looking at an electromagnetic spectrum, um, 
let's let's go back to that slide. If you look in an electromagnetic spectrum, uh, especially if you're looking in, in the visible in the visible light, uh, each element uh, emits if it's if it's hit with sufficiently uh, strong radiation enough, um, it emits in a specific color uh, that our eyes can see. For example, um, hydrogen I think emits somewhere towards the blue and argon towards the red and so on and so forth. So um, the Whenever you're looking at a light source, like a star, you can map out its electromagnetic signature, the range uh, in the electromagnetic spectrum that it emits at. So the different elements in a star emit at different frequencies and therefore show up as different colors in the, on the EM spectrum as emission lines. Now suppose you have a cloud of gas uh, composed of hydrogen between you and a star. The cloud will absorb radiation from the star being emitted or broadcast over the frequencies of hydrogen. So this will show up as a dark line on the EM spectral map, um, signifying an absence of those, of those frequencies. Um, and if you're looking at um, a, a non-light emitting source, something that's really cold, uh, such as an interstellar molecular cloud of gas, the EM spectrum will look like a continuous black line, so you won't see any of these colors here. You would just see the colors that the cloud of gas is composed of. So if it's a hydrogen gas cloud, you, you're going to see maybe one line here, one line here, and then one line here, with everything else being black, or whatever the signature of hydrogen is, uh, I meant to say. And these strips will be located at the frequencies at which the cloud, uh, a thermal source emitting in the infrared, is emitting. Uh, so when um, astrophysicists look at uh, those sources, they look at them with uh, telescopes capable of collecting uh, infrared radiation and they can determine them and then that that's how they can determine the molecular composition of stars and clouds let's get into stellar evolution now a star is formed from a molecular cloud of gas that um, over a period of time collapses on itself this happens because of the interaction um, between its particles as they clump together they begin to attract more particles meaning that more particles get stuck on that one cluster of molecules and this generates both heat and gravity um, because as we know a sufficient amount of matter concentrated in a single region of space warps it and that causes objects um, within w with less mass nearby to either fall in on this region of warped space or orbit it if they had sufficient um, momentum or sufficient velocity prior to being captured by the gravitational field so as this molecular cloud of gas uh, is getting hotter and denser it eventually ignites into a protostar, not a true star because of the absence of nuclear fusion in the core, um, but it generates its light and energy from gravitational contraction. And as the protostar uh, continues to collapse inwards, the central region gets hot and dense enough to ignite uh, nuclear fusion. At this point, gravitational contraction stops being down. It stops because the outer pressure generated by fusion is balanced by the inner pressure of the star's uh, heavy outer layers of matter. And the star ceases to collapse and becomes stable and reaches um, a stage of where it's a true star. And as it ages, it goes through its life cycle, and depending on its mass, it either gradually expands and cools, turning into a red giant, uh, or turns into a supernova, um, and later on, either into a neutron star or into a black hole depending on how how massive it is and how the supernova process goes a red giant uh, eventually turns into a white dwarf um, which actually the white dwarf was uh, always there to begin with within the within the red um, giant but it, it appears red and, and large because of the huge atmosphere um, that's around it the central region of uh, a red giant um, is the white dwarf and the matter uh, on the outside is very uh, thinly inter interspersed. A supernova, um, like, like I said, leaves behind a neutron star uh, and if it's really massive then it turns into a black hole because matter collapses on the inner, inner region uh, faster than it can escape it. On a quick side note, uh, a supernova is not a symmetric explosion. Uh, so once it happens, the neutron star doesn't uh, just remain uh, stationary in space. Uh, it's usually kicked off in a specific duration and just um, uh, trails through space. 
let's look at the, the definitions of the terms we used. Uh, protostar is a contracting mass of gas that represents an early stage in the formation of a star before uh, nuclear synthesis or nuclear fusion has begun. Gravitational contraction, uh, that's the inward fall uh, or accretion, if you will, of mass under the influence of a gravitational field. And accretion is the process of growth or increase, uh, typically by the gradual accumulation of additional layers of matter. Uh, the main proton-proton um, chain, is, here's what, uh, what we see, is the proton-proton chain and that is the main fusion process uh, taking place uh, in the core of our own star, the Sun. Um, the main uh, reaction comprises about 69% of all reactions taking place inside the core and the remaining 31% is split into 99 uh, taking this form and less than half of 1% taking this form. Um, basically what's happening is um, two hydrogen atoms collide, uh, they create a hydrogen isotope, an electron, and a neutrino as a byproduct. Um, and imagine these reactions taking place millions of times per, per second all over um, um, even a small region of space in the core of a star, so it's actually happening billions of times. And um, eventually um, this um, hydrogen isotope uh, collides with a regular hydrogen and then produces a helium atom and a gamma ray. Uh, and then from there, it can go into multiple ways. Um, two heliums can collide and create a byproduct of a helium isotope and two hydrogen atoms. And then at this point, um, the first uh, reaction chain is complete because we now have, as you can see, two hydrogen atoms. And we go right back to where we started, uh, where the two hydrogen collide, create a hydrogen isotope, um, an electron, and a neutrino. Down here we have a more more complicated reactions that are more rare. Um, we have two, or we have one helium with one helium isotope creating a beryllium and a gamma ray. Um, here the beryllium uh, collides with an electron, uh, which produces a lithium and a neutrino, and the lithium hits a hydrogen. Um, and as you can see, this is this is how the star creates elements within its core. So um, different elements, up to iron, and we'll see why it stops at iron here in a second, are created within the core of a star. And this is how it happens. Um, as as the size of the atom gets larger, the um, probability of it happening is, is smaller, and it happens less throughout the core. Um, but we get uh, boron here, um, beryllium, and then the reaction continues. But essentially what this is saying is that we have um, one hydrogen, um, one helium, a uh, positron, uh, which creates a gamma ray. I'm, I'm talking about the, f the first reaction here. Um, one gamma ray, and this is the symbol for it, uh, gamma, and one neutrino. And that can be either an um, electron neutrino, a mu, or a, a tau neutrino, respectively, with tau being the heaviest. And something that's not on this graph is uh, the carbon-nitrogen-oxygen cycle. Uh, that's a cycle that stars heavier than our sun use to generate energy. Uh, it's quite common uh, for stars at 1.2 solar masses or above. Uh, and in that, in that cycle, basically four protons fuse using carbon-nitrogen-oxygen isotopes as a catalyst to produce one alpha particle. Um, think back to the definition we had um, about the alpha particle two positrons and two electron neutrinos. It's the main source of energy generations for stars, um, like we said, about 1.2 times the size of the sun. Um, the proton-proton chain dominates in our, in our star, though. Here we see a, um, a pre-nova star, or a star that's losing the battle with gravity. Nuclear fusion is no longer sufficiently strong to prevent the collapse of the core under the star's own weight. Uh, before we before we go on to how that happens and how heavier elements, um, heavier than iron, are created, let's uh, summarize the beginning stages of evolution of a star. So, over time, as the particles in an interstellar cloud of gas begin to clump together and co contract because of gravitational contraction, it turns into a protostar, which then becomes sufficiently dense and hot enough to ignite into nuclear fusion. 
this is how uh, true stars are formed. Now this is a, is a snapshot of what uh, the inner layers of a star looked like much later on, millions uh, of years la uh, later on in its life cycle. Um, the iron core of a star is no longer capable of supporting the layers of matter on top of it because of the imbalance between weight, uh, that's gravity in, and force generated through nuclear fusion. Um, that's the proton-proton or uh, the CNO, the carbon-nitrogen-oxygen chains we went over. Um, which um, and these reactions push the weight outwards, uh, preventing the collapse. But once the core isn't able to support sufficiently strong reactions across the board or across the entire core, then that leads to a core collapse. And this creates a supernova where the outer layers of the star are violently expelled, and the energy generated of the supernova uh, is what leads to the formation of elements heavier than iron. So thorium, uranium, uh, anything heavier than iron actually is created uh, in that violent explosion that we call supernova. Here we see some more definitions. Um, and we'll see examples of, of each in a, in a diagram in a little bit. But the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, also called the HR diagram, is a scatter graph of stars. Uh, showing the relationship between the star's absolute magnitude or luminosity versus their spectral types or classifications and effective temperatures. So imagine um, that the scatter graph is a snapshot of a specific uh, moment in time um, of um, stars, their luminosities, their temperatures, um, and uh, it's plotted out. But now imagine that you take multiple snapshots throughout um, every few million years or so and you will see and you're tracking imagine you're tracking the same stars you're going to see movement on that graph as stars evolve uh, so what you're going to see is there, um, the relationship and the, the movement of stars on the HR di diagram as they go through their life cycle if they're on the main sequence um, they go um, from the bottom right of the graph to the upper left uh, and eventually either um, go through their main sequence turnoff or continue to expand and die out in a supernova. Uh, if they do make the turnoff, then they, that's how you get red giants. And then once the red giant cools, it falls down on the graph or white dwarfs rat. And we'll see that uh, here in a minute. Um, the main sequence turnoff, um, that's a special point on the HR diagram that we mentioned uh, for a star cluster or a star indicative of its age and its point in stellar evolution. So let's take a look at the diagram. This is the HR diagram, and we have uh, luminosity on the y-axis and temperature on the x-axis. Um, and sometimes you have luminosity on, on this side, and you have absolute magnitude on this side. So in effect, you can have three different axes. But this is the main sequence that we talked about. And we have um, M-class M stars, or red stars, um, R star here at a classification of G, and then A or B stars here, um, blue giants if you will. Um, and those are uh, the stars that are heavy enough to create a supernova. And as you can see, uh, the density in the cluster, the density in stars here is less than in the main sequence is because uh, these stars have a very br brief life. Basically, the larger and the hotter or more luminous a star is, the, the shorter its life cycle. Th these can last anywhere between a few dozen or a few um, hundred million years. Red giants can last for billions of years. Um, so as a star is created somewhere on this main sequence graph, as it ages, um, it expands. You know, say for example, a star that's at 1.2 solar masses here, and that's usually the stars we're talking about. Um, it expands. It doesn't necessarily have to go and turn into um, a blue giant or a blue star, or change its luminosity. For example, our sun will turn into a red giant without um, getting all the way up here on the main sequence. Um, what's probably going to happen is it's going to start turning off here and make um, make the main sequence turn off uh, at about in the middle of the graph here. And then um, it's not on the graph, but uh, white, dwarf, white dwarfs will be down here um, towards the intersection of the x and, and y axis um, because uh, while their luminosity is um, while the temperature is very high, their luminosity is not because they're very dense and very small. 
uh, well, they're huge, but they're small compared to red giants. The reason why red giants have such a high luminosity but such a low temperature is because they're large and cool, but they have so much surface area that they're putting out more photons um, than a white dwarf is capable of in a small area. And thus, red giants are more luminous in, in the sky than white dwarfs are. And that's basically it for this walkthrough. Um, if you guys are interested or have any questions, uh, I can put together a, a second walkthrough that expands on some of these concepts. But for, for some further reading, um, if you're interested in this stuff, Newton's prism experiments are, are very interesting to see um, the way light works, uh, spectral types, um, to learn more about absorption um, and emission lines. And usually I find it I find it interesting to, and very helpful actually, to go back in time and learn about uh, a subject as it evolves through time. Physics uh, today is very complex, and if you were to pick up a book on M theory or quantum electrodynamics, it's very mathematical and you'll get lost very quickly. I know I do. Uh, but if, if you start off with something simple um, like uh, Newtonian, classical Newtonian mechanics, um, Leibniz, and um, some of the earlier authors, you can get a foundation for what they're talking about and then you can move on to uh, Ernest B. Rutherford, um, Niels Bohr, and Einstein's papers in the early 20th century, uh, late 19th, early 20th century. Um, and then once you're familiar with that, then you can move into more contemporary um, physics that combine classical concepts and then overlay quantum concepts on top of that. Um, the second book that I really like is uh, called Unsolved Problems in Astrophysics by John uh, Ann Bacow. Uh, this book is good because it's not a book per se, it's a collection of um, scholarly essays from uh, physicists and it addresses unsolved problems in contemporary physics and it talks about a lot of the subjects that we touched on and there's a whole article in there about uh, how and why protostars, or not protostars, uh, neutron stars are kicked off by irregularities um, or deficiencies in, or not deficiencies, in um, an asymmetric uh, supernova explosion. And there's a, a wide variety of topics in there. Um, and you don't have to read all of them for the book to make sense. Uh, some of them are not uh, mathematical at all, they're more conceptual in nature and they're very easy to understand. So I find it a very helpful text and very interesting um, as an introduction to some of the things that physicists are currently working on. Well, like I said, this is it for this walkthrough. Thank you, and uh, don't forget to rate. This is our College of Designs, signing out.